This evening's message, the title is The Sin Dilemma Part 1. It's called Part 1 because in about two weeks' time I'll be back to deliver Part 2. So if you like it tonight, I'll see you in two weeks. In the tradition of Christianity, for centuries there has been a pattern in our worship that involves some form of confession, the assurance of forgiveness of sin. In the, the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, there were confessional booths. And when sins were confessed privately to the priest, the priest then expressed God's forgiveness to people. And he told the parishioner what penance should be done and then absolve the parishioner from their sin. Now, since the Reformation, the thinking has altered somewhat. There was a, a backlash against the monetary incentives that were corrupting the leaders of the time, attaching to forgiveness some sort of cash donation to the church. And there was a resistance to that whole confessional process even. The Protestant churches insisted that the people should take their sins and their confessions straight to God in prayer, as modeled in Jesus' time in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness became a matter between the individual and God. And as Christians, we were called upon to extend forgiveness to others because God forgave us. In Matthew 6, verse 14, it says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, there is a somewhat familiar summary of the gospel message in 1 John 1 that is often read during worship services today in, in association with these ideas of, of confession and assurance. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness... We lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us all our sins and purifies us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Now, if we work our way backward through our, this passage that we just read, that there are certain things that are affirmed. First, we've all sinned. The word sin can be a verb or it can be a noun. As a verb, it's an action that we do. We sin. And as a noun, it's something that we possess. We have sin in our lives. In the church today, we tend to talk about sin. We are quick to identify certain things as sins. We don't often define the word sin. We know that we're all sinners and, and we need to be saved from our sin. But what is it really? What is this thing called sin? If someone were to ask you, how would you give a clear definition? It's important particularly for Christians, to be able to answer that question very clearly. The, the gospel message depends on it. How can we call people to be saved without knowing what they're being saved from? Some might say sin is doing something that's wrong. But a relativist might well ask, well, wrong by whose standards? 
what's right and wrong for you may be different than what's right and wrong for the next person. At least that's the thinking of many people today. Someone else might try to clarify it a little bit by saying, well, sin is a violation of God's commandments. But there again, we, we might well ask which ones. There are hundreds of commandments in the Bible, and we really don't live by them anymore. For instance, in, in Leviticus 19, 19, it says, Do not wear clothing that is woven of two different kinds of material. So does that mean wearing that polyester cotton blend t-shirt or stretch jeans is, is a sin? Even if we are to focus our attention strictly on the Ten Commandments, I dare say that many people in society would hedge their bets on murder and adultery being much more serious than lying or cursing. And to a degree, there is some sense of logic there. So what exactly is sin? Sin is anything that lessens or reduces the perfection that God created us to be. In the original languages of the Bible, the word sin carries with it a sense of missing the mark or falling short of the perfection of God. Genesis 1 describes humanity as being created in the image of God, but we've fallen short. We've missed the mark of that perfection. And part of that degeneracy is based on the sin of Adam and Eve when they first disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. But all of us have that defect of prideful sinfulness and selfishness in us. To be holy is to be like God, to, to resemble him, to love him, and to love his creation. To be conformed into his desire for us and his will. Prideful sinfulness or selfishness is essentially part of all sin. Setting our will over and above God's will. And when Jesus summarizes the Ten Commandments or he summarizes all the law and the prophets and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Sin is anything less than that kind of perfect love. But if we're honest with ourselves, none of us live up to that level of perfection. The second truth that's affirmed in 1 John 1 is that we can be forgiven. And we can be purified from our sins through confession by faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus died on the cross so many years ago and, and he took the penalty for our sins, the forgiveness that we have as Christians is for all of our past, all of our present, and all of our future sin. By faith we accept that truth as a gift from God. And as Christians, we have a, a fellowship, a spiritual connection with Christ, not because of what we have done, but because Jesus' atoning death makes us right with God. There's a new and eternal life that we have going forward, a life that includes a connection, or perhaps better stated, a reconnection with God through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. So there's a, a sin dilemma here. And that's this. If we are Christians, if we are the Christian people, if we have been forgiven of all of our sins and the Holy Spirit lives in us, and by the power of the Holy Spirit we have this new life, then how can there still be sin in our lives. 
How can God's Holy Spirit live in us if, according to Psalm 5, he is not a God who is pleased with wickedness? And with God, evil people are not welcome. There are stories in the Old Testament where God's holy presence is enough to kill people. So how is it that God's Holy Spirit can live in us if we still have sin in our lives? And that's where Romans 7 comes in. Paul describes this dilemma in a slightly different way. In our passage this evening, he he talks about the law of God and how the law of God is, is a good thing because it points out to us that we are indeed sinful people, that we are condemned to the penalty of sin, which is death. And in verse 9, Paul writes, Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. In other words, without knowing the difference between right and wrong, we wouldn't know what sin is. Think that through for a moment. If as parents we don't teach our children right from wrong, we can't very well blame the kids when they misbehave. Essentially, Paul is saying the same kind of thing here. God gives us the law to let us know what is right and what is wrong. Remember how the serpent twisted God's words in the garden. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil. Knowing right from wrong. We see ourselves in our our prideful selfishness and we recognize our own sin. And having received the law, we immediately realize that we've sinned and we're doomed to a penalty of eternal death. And then, then Paul then goes on to say that no matter how hard he tries, he cannot seem to pull himself out of this sinfulness that snares his life. For I have a desire to do what's good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. And so the dilemma is, how can it, this perfect God live in us if we keep on sinning? And this is why Paul asks the big question, what a wretched man am I? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? See, the solution to the dilemma is that God can live in us precisely because of what Jesus did on the cross. His righteousness has been granted to us, even in our sinful state. Even though we do exactly what we don't want to do, and we can't seem to do what's right, we're still forgiven because of what God has done through Christ. Philippians 3 verse 9, Paul writes of the source of this perfect righteousness that we have in God's eyes, not having a righteousness of our own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Walter Wanger in in his book, Ragman and Other Cries of Faith, tells the story of a ragman who wanders the city crying out, and he cries out, rags, new rags for old. Give me your old rags and I'll give you new. And as he finds the hurting and the lost, he exchanges their rags of pain and sorrow and tragedy with perfect clean linens and blankets and robes. The story is a picture of Christ and those who put their trust in him who are are described in Revelation 7 
as having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And because of Christ's sacrifice, we have inherited a righteousness, a perfection that is not our own. And when God sees us, he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. God sees the perfection of Christ covering our sinfulness, replacing it. Our passage from Romans concludes with this line, thanks be to God who delivers me through the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. If the answer to the sin dilemma is that we don't have to strive for perfection to earn God's approval, to somehow be worthy of God's presence in our lives. And instead, the answer is that Jesus Christ, in dying on the cross for our sins, has imparted to us his perfection so that God can live in us by his Holy Spirit. So why is it that we, as Christians, get so hung up on sin The truth is we shouldn't get hung up on sin in the Christian life because we are forgiven people. We are no longer slaves to sin. We ought to become slaves to God's law. Instead of figuring out what is sin and what is not and and parsing all the detail of that, we need to focus our attention on how to live the laws of holiness And love in light of God's grace to us. That's the the task of Christians. It's, It's a difficult journey sometimes. A man was wrestling with an issue in his life and regarding a sexual sin. And the Christian counseling couple that met with this man essentially said to him, God's call on our lives is not to figure out what is sin and what is not sin. The fact is we've all sinned. What we need to do is seek out God's grace and forgiveness first and then after that it's not our job to draw the lines in the sand, to draw the lines of behavior that's acceptable or not acceptable in the world by saying this far and no further. God's call on our life at that point is to be holy so now let's, let's look at your situation in your life and, and ask the more important questions. What does it mean for God to call you to holiness in your situation? For many of us who have grown up in Christian homes, it doesn't mean very much. We've always been taught what's right from wrong and it's all very black and white. Very little gray. But let me give you an extreme example. In many of the mission fields years ago, missionaries would would share the gospel message with tribes where it was common for a man to have multiple wives. And as the men of these tribes would become Christians, the missionaries needed to figure out what to do with the converts to Christianity who had already married several women. Should they divorce all but one of their wives? But then divorce is wrong, according to the Bible. Should they simply declare the second, third, and fourth marriages annulled? Or should the husband love and respect the many wives? What does holiness look like in a broken world that's being redeemed by God's grace? That seems like maybe an extreme and abstract situation. But there are all kinds of dilemmas that sin presents to the church. Churches today have similar questions to face, similar situations. It won't be long 
Now that same-sex marriage is legal in Canada, how long will it be before the Christian church needs to respond to a same-sex married couple that comes to faith? And perhaps even more challenging, what if only one of the partners comes to faith? There are no easy answers. I can't see God's grace saying, oh, sorry, you've crossed the line, no grace for you. No chance of your being saved anymore. It's part of the dilemma of sin in the church, and we need to face it. Mike Iaconelli tells a story in his book, Messy Spirituality, of of a couple of young people whom he calls Greg and Diane, who had moved in together much to the disappointment of their parents. And before long... Knowing their parents were displeased, Greg and Diane decided to get married. Greg's parents were a little bit happier, but still somewhat restrained. But then, while the plans for the wedding were being made, Diane discovered that she was pregnant. And realizing that the pregnancy would upset her parents, or his parents, even more so, Greg decided to call off the wedding and use the money that they were going to spend on the wedding for their new baby instead. And the couple opted for a simple courthouse wedding with the justice of the peace and only a couple of close friends served as witnesses. A few weeks later, at a gathering of the friends, conversation turned to Greg and Diane's wedding. And everyone kind of felt it was a non-wedding It was so impersonal and isolated, completely outside of community. And as the conversation developed, an idea came to them that as a group of friends of Greg and Diane, one said, well, why don't we give them a wedding? Give them the wedding that they never had. And so they did. They set a date contacted both families, created a surprise wedding. Sixty family and friends were involved in the conspiracy of grace. To make sure that the couple were available for their surprise wedding day, Greg and Diane were invited to the best man's house for a dress-up dinner. When they arrived, the couple was kidnapped by their friends, and each of them were taken by their friends to have a guy's night or a girl's night out. While they were having their bachelor and bachelorette parties they they never had before, they were each asked a whole series of questions. Like, now that you've been married for these three months, what mistakes have you made? What can we do as a community to help you in your marriage? And both the young husband and wife were given pictures of their spouse. And they were asked to write on the back all the reasons that they loved that person. And when each of these two parties were, were over, both Greg and Diane thought that the surprise was over. You can only imagine their shock when they returned to the best man's house to find their families were waiting for them laughing and yelling, surprise! It took both Greg and Diane a very long time to stop crying. And after they had regained their composure, everybody moved to the backyard and they were surrounded by flowers and a minister was waiting there. And the couple exchanged vows and each parent vowed their support And all their friends walked by with their congratulations and whispered a blessing to Greg and Diane. And when the service was over, there wasn't a dry eye anywhere. Everyone left knowing that they had participated in a moment of grace. And Iaconelli concludes his story with a paragraph. He says, the kingdom monitors would have raised their voices immediately. You can't do that. You're condoning the sins of these two young people who lived together and conceived a baby before they were ever married. 
real Christians don't condone unbiblical living. And they'd be correct. Christians don't condone unbiblical living. But we do redeem it. How do we deal with the sin dilemma? We need to redeem it. Or perhaps better still, we need to partner with God to redeem it through his grace. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's so easy for us to draw lines in the sand to say this is right, this is wrong, to point fingers. But Lord, we all have sin in our lives. We all need your redeeming grace. And Lord, we need you. We thank you that Jesus died on the cross and took all of our sins upon himself May we now focus on loving people. May we focus our attention on showing as much grace and love as we possibly can. And Lord, where there is sin still, where people don't know your grace, may we be used as outlets by you where where people can know what it means to be forgiven and may they see in us your love we pray this Lord in Jesus name Amen we're going to sing together and we'll stand to sing